All right, uh, we can start now. Hello, everyone. My name is Jorge Campos. I'm a PhD candidate in the Joel Jensus Research Group, and I'm accompanied by Dr. Bo Xiang from the Wei Xiong's Group at UC San Diego. And we welcome you to this very special edition of the Polariton Chemistry Webinars. Before we start with our event, I would like to make a few announcements and introduce the mechanics of this session. Uh, first, this is the last webinar of the year. 2020 has been a wild ride, and we're very thankful for your participation and engagement in this effort. While we expect things getting slowly to normal, we also want this forum to remain open and keep bringing our community together. We already have some talks and events scheduled for next year's first few weeks, and there's more to come. We'll keep holding the webinar every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can register for each talk through this link or the one we provide in the reminder email we send every week. Uh, by the end of January, we're having our third postdoc spotlight. If you're interested in participating, please go to this link and submit your abstract before December 23rd. I would like to mention our Polariton Chemistry Online Community webpage on Facebook, which allows everyone to share papers and post announcements. You can find it by the name here displayed on the screen. Additionally, we have uploaded our recorded videos from this Polariton Chemistry webinar to a YouTube channel. For those who miss the talk, you can subscribe and watch these videos later. I would like to encourage you to be a positive influence online and use the comment section to further the discussion about the topics on the webinars. Finally, I'll introduce the mechanics of today's webinar. So in the interest of time, this occasion, there won't be oral participation from the audience. So uh, please don't raise your hand. Uh, however, you're invited to type your comments or ideas in the chat function so that you can share with everyone. Additionally, you can type your questions in the Q&A panel. Bo will select the most relevant ones and bring them to the table at appropriate times. Uh, before we move on to today's event, I'd like to thank the 80 participants, 80 and these who keep showing continued support. Today's session is a roundtable discussion on one of the hottest topics in our field, modification of chemical kinetics inside the infrared microcavities. We've had a fair share of talks devoted to advances in this topic, and we know that there are still many open questions and the characteristics of this phenomenon are yet to be understood. So we invited four prominent scientists two experimentalists and two theorists uh, to have an open discussion about the current status of this line of research. In our distinguished panel, we have Dr. Claudia Clement. She did her PhD research in nanostructures at the University of Barcelona and has carried out research internships at the Institute of Radical Chemistry from the University of Aix Marcel in France and at the Nanoscience Center from the University of Yavskula in Finland. She is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of the University Autonomous of Madrid, working in the field of polaritonic chemistry within the group of Professor Johannes Feist. We also have Professor Gino George, who entered the field of polariton chemistry starting from the group of Professor Thomas Evesen in the University of Strasbourg, France. After that, he joined the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Mohali. His current research goal is to study in depth the influence of vibrational strong coupling on chemical reactivity, as well as on the properties of materials. Also with us, is Dr. Blake Sipkins. He joined the Naval Research Lab in 2004. Since then, he's mainly interested in strong coupling systems that can alter chemical reactivity, excitation, and decay kinetics, and form both Einstein condensates. He is also part of the pioneer team who utilized ultrafast nonlinear spectroscopy to study molecular vibrational polaritons. And finally, we're honored to have Professor Joseph Botnik, who obtained his PhD in UC Berkeley in biophysics. He then continued his research in the Tel Aviv and Northwestern universities. He joined the chemistry department of University of Pennsylvania in 2010. His research focuses on structuring the most natural semi-classical approach for modeling electronic transitions and electromagnetic fields in light matter strong coupling systems. Please give a warm welcome to our panelists from wherever you're watching us. And uh, now let me uh, set up the rules. We have some questions planned for the panel to discuss. Uh, so whenever I ask one, I will give each panelist a turn to talk. And once the four panelists have shared their initial thoughts on each question, I will open the table to interactions among the panelists. I'll just ask you to keep your interventions as brief as possible. So let's begin with the fundamentals. Uh, 
We have asked the panelists to give a short opening statement on their experience and understanding of cavity effects on ground state chemical kinetics. So uh, let's begin with one of the researchers who work in the experiments that initiated everything. Uh, Dr. George, the floor is yours. All right, yeah. Thank you, Jorge, for, 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 your, for your wonderful introduction. So uh, do I, shall I just share my screen if possible? Like I can just show one or two slides very quickly. You, you can share if you want. All right, so would I share screen? All right, so can you see my screen now? Yes. All right, so I just made a few slides to quickly sh share with you guys. Okay, so um, thank you once again for, for all the all the team behind this. This is very nice that this community come together and discuss uh, for the front front of research about the matter that is basically very interesting, like strong coupling uh, I mean, I would say that strong coupling chemistry today. So, uh, so I am basically uh, a trained uh, chemist. Uh, I would say, like I, I started working with organic molecules. Later on, I jumped into physical chemistry. Now I am trying to do some interesting research. So, so uh, this discussion came up. I got a chance to work with Thomas Abbasson in the beginning in 2012, where we are trying to understand uh, literally the effect of strong coupling, which control molecular and material properties. So, uh, so there is all we've started with. So, uh, so my group currently now I am a, a assistant professor in, in Indian Institute of Science Education Research in Mohali in India. So our group mainly focus on uh, molecular strong coupling. Okay, so, so I just want to bring you this, this paper because maybe it's basically a thought provoking paper where basically I was trying to understand in the beginning where, I mean, when history started, where we're trying to couple uh, vibrations where we, along with my colleague at Epsha Lab in Thomas Edison Lab in 2014. So uh, earlier there was one or two paper from Thomas Group where they were able to control chemical reactions by coupling electronic state. The, the paper one, basically they tried to use pyropyrene and merosine in system. And uh, then later we were continuously thinking about how to control chemical reactions like this magic that people were thinking about in coherent chemistry concept or the coherent chemical control. Uh, so these two paper came into our mind. Uh, one paper is basically the, this paper I was just telling, maybe I'll use uh, uh, laser pointer. You can see that softening of H2 plus ion molecular bonds in the intense laser field. Uh, by by a team from Bell Laboratories, and and you can see that uh, they try to use very high intense laser, roughly around 56 terawatts of power, and they could able to to pump into the excited state energy levels of the system, and they could able to see that the opening of the well happen, or they call it as bond softening. So they call softening of the bond. So they can try to understand. They basically see that the the, the bond is. Uh, the, the excited state is operating and we get basically get an H2 plus molecular ions. So another then I we try to went back a little bit back towards the time of uh, George C. Pimental, uh, where he was the inventor of this chemical laser. At the same time, he was also introduced this beautiful concept of mass metric isolation spectroscopy. So at, you know, at, at very low temperature, they basically try to uh, deposit molecules and gases on, on surface beautifully, and then they can study specifically their reactions or their interaction in, in molecular level. So one of these experiments, selective vibrational excitations of ethylene fluorine reactions in nitrogen matrix. So this paper also uh, got our attention so that you can see that here, what they did that the ethylene molecule reacts with fluorine form an adduct here. And this particular reaction has appeared in 1983. And you can see here that you look into these bonds, particularly uh, here V11 and V9, which are basically uh, CH, uh, you know, CH stretching modes of different CH stretching mode. But they pump specifically because they have these beautiful, at the time, these chemical lasers in which they can create all these beams specifically. And they can say, for example, V9, which is around 3100, roughly around, when they shine this light for a for few, uh, few, few minutes to a few hours on that particular uh, reaction, they can see that the reaction is really getting boosted up. Okay, so very specifically targeting vibration. So you also, they try to couple combinations bands. 
So uh, the the bond softening concept all the way to controlling or selectively heating, uh, this become uh, a practice to physical chemists at the time, and then they were trying to dream about this particular concept afterwards that that can call us a, in general coherence control of chemical reactions and so forth. Like people like Professor Ahmed Sail and so many people worked on it to show that the existence. So this is where it started. So I will show one more slide so to, to initiate the discussion. So while to compare this, this concept to, because in one, the first case, the, 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 the Bell Laboratory, the, the experiment that are shown uh, in the previous slide, was they using very high intense lasers, literally, you know, that are light field approaches the internuclear binding field of the molecule, and the molecule potentially deformed and called bond softening process happened because the nucleus, uh, you know, not able to ever cope with the electron, which is oscillating very fast, and then basically softening happens there. So here you're thinking about a concept which is very, very strongly bomb bombing energy into the system, and you think about a low intensity, almost zero photon here, with respect to strong coupling chemistry, molecule is strongly coupled within the vacuum field of the optical cavity. Do these things. So I, I, I have just uh, just gave you this. This is this concept is quite fascinating, and I hope that will emerge as actually a very interesting field. There are of course a lot of limitation, a lot of understanding. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns in this, but I still believe that this can can uh, bring a lot of input to, especially who's who is working on chemical reaction control and similar aspects. So. So I just have uh, put up some names here. You can see that a lot of people are working on this now, especially I put the people from the experimental side, maybe other people like Joseph and Claudia Canado add into it of the theoretical side, but these are the people I, I thought I, I, I might have missed some names, but you can see that uh, there is a list of people that are already working in this field that starting from pure classical uh, kinetics and thermodynamics, physical chemistry to the understanding of 2D spectroscopy and it's further input in this, this field. So it may be very, very interesting that if the discussion start from here and I, I give, I mean, uh, somebody else can speak about this aspect further. So please, Jorge. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gina. So uh, with that, I'd like to give the word to one of the theorists involved in investigating this topic from the beginning, co-authoring multiple papers, which have been a huge role in shaping our understanding of this phenomenon. Uh, Dr. Clement, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jorge. Hi. So, yeah, very nice introduction, Gino. So, well, I ended up in this uh, in this uh, subject from in a different way. So, I I did my PhD in Barcelona, working on electronic excited states um, on molecular photophysics, and then I studied my postdoc three years ago here in Madrid with Johannes in the group of Johannes Feist. And well, I remember he showed these papers um, by. The, the Everson group, which are really interesting, and well, with with Kotar Vidal also, and with Javi Gallego, who was doing his PhD, we started working on this, trying to understand these experiments. So we we have some paper on that, and well, we're still trying to understand this, and I think it's a very good, good opportunity here to share ideas. Maybe will help us all. So I would say my current understanding now is that there are several experiments by different groups when that couple either to reactant vibrations or to the solvent and there are changes. So the kinetics is modified, but I would say we still don't know why this is happening. We, so from, from a theoretical point of view, what we found is that um, we cannot understand this resonance condition, which is clearly shown in the experiment. So, and well, we can discuss about this. Um, yeah, that would be it, I think for, as an introduction. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Claudia. Uh, so now we would like to have a fresher perspective on the experimental underpinnings of this phenomena. He recently gave us a very illuminating talk on the topic in this very webinar. Uh, Dr. Simpkins, please talk to us. Uh, thanks. Um, I don't know about a fresher perspective necessarily. Um, I did put together one slide to kind of describe um, kind of how we got into this and, and where we've um, uh, where we've gone. Uh, so I'm at the Naval Research Lab and um, uh, I have to say that I've, I've felt the collaborations both inside my lab with the people listed there and with the UCSD crew and more recently with uh, Felipe Herrera at University of Santiago have really made all the difference. <clears throat> 
Um, I, I was and am a material scientist uh, working on nanoscale materials. And when I and uh, Jeff, uh, Jim Long and Jeff Rutsky thought about doing this first experiment, I'm not a chemist and I'm not a physicist and I don't know very much about optics at all at that point. And um, I, I was really kind of just hanging on for dear life, but I learned a lot from them. And since then we've been able to uh, do a decent amount of work. And I think you can see that perspective in our work where we've started with some very, very basic uh, investigations, trying to understand what strong coupling is, what the signatures are, um, how we can control it and so on. Um, and and with, with the goal of eventually attacking chemistry. Um, so, so early on, of course, we thought, well, if we're creating two new levels, these new states might alter activation energies or energy barriers. They might represent relaxation channels in a very vague way. So sure, maybe, maybe they'll impact chemistry. And it's new and exciting enough that we'll just try it with no more understanding than that and, and see how far we can go. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've been able to do quite, quite a bit of important work um, in the ultra fast regime. And that's the work of Jeff Rutsky, Adam Dunkelberger and some collaborations with uh, Hoel and Wei. Um, and, and those have been very exciting. Uh, I think it's yet to be determined what those types of results will tell us about uh, modified reaction mechanisms. I have to let my cat in the room because she's tearing up the carpet. Sorry, that's the realities of quarantine life. Um, but but we, we, um, we've persevered on, um, we've read publication after publication from the Evison group and, and his former grad students and postdocs who are doing great work. And I think after this many publications, we should all be convinced, yes, yes, it's, it's real, something's happening, even if we don't understand it at all. Um, uh, I will highlight one, one uh, theoretical publication our group put out down here, this band diagram uh, is from that publication. And that's from our theorist, Igor Vergoffman, who's been skeptical from day one, well, more than skeptical. He's told us it shouldn't work, it shouldn't work, it shouldn't work. He finally put pen to paper and showed us analytically why it shouldn't work, or at least why certain approaches, uh, certain descriptions shouldn't work. And, uh, and that's good too, um, because that helps us and theorists kind of, uh, I don't know, see where the dead ends are, I guess, and, and continue to move forward. Um, and I mean, I guess that summarizes where we are and where we're coming from. Like everyone else, we're, we're curious what the answers are. There, there seems to be shortcomings to most experiments and theories, but putting everything together in one basket can be pretty hard. And so I guess we try to address one, one issue at a time. Um, but that's, that's me and our work in a nutshell. And I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you, Blake. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I hope we, we can discuss that uh, that approach by Paul Gatman. Uh, so, last but not least, uh, another theorist uh, co authoring several recent papers that have put forward a perspective with quite strong implications about the topic, uh, Professor Subotnik, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to share my screen also then. One second here. Uh, so uh, I thought, I don't know if that comes out. You guys can see my screen? Yeah, I yes. can see. So I thought uh, I also wanted just to, uh, I, I very much liked what, what Blake said. I thought I should also say where I came from. Uh, my background is that uh, I'm basically, uh, by this point in time, I guess mostly a chemical dynamicist. I think mostly about um, rates of reactions and um, the interchange of energy. And really, I got my chops in, 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 in chemistry and physics by studying uh, semi-classical approaches to non-adiabatic problems, how to think about uh, nuclei moving and exchanging 
uh, energy with electrons, the, unders, under, the underpinnings of Marcus theory and whatnot. And a few years ago, I was dragged, uh, like I guess Blake, I was dragged kicking and screaming uh, by Abe Nitsan, uh, who was my postdoc advisor and now my colleague at the University of Pennsylvania and a very talented grad student, Tao, uh, into this area of, uh, uh, of polaritonic uh, stuff because uh, we, had, we had worked out several uh, problems where we had thought to ourselves the fundamental connection between electronic pho phononic problems and electronic photonic problems. And this was the natural consequence of all that. Um, I share Blake's exact question. What, is the, uh, what are the implications, if any, of the ultra fast uh, work? There's so much out there. Um, with strong fields. And one of the things that Abe and I always talk about with Tau is the question of uh, what are the implications of knowing how a material responds to a big electric field, what happens in, in vacuum? And, and uh, I guess that's also what Gino is asking us. What, can, what I can tell you about what I know so far, um, what our work has convinced me of is that none of this uh, ground state catalysis can be explained if I just use classical equilibrium theory, at least at least naively, that, 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 that's what I understand. Uh, everything I've done suggests that it's just really hard to come up with a collective rate constant that is not entirely coherent. And I imagine we'll talk something about the word coherence over and over today. Um, recently, we've done a lot of work trying to uh, uh, look at large systems in cavities, really just studying with basic molecular dynamics protocols. And this is all due to a, uh, our very talented grad student, Tao, who decided that he was Wanted, wanted to go beyond model problems and just see what happens if you put these things in a big simulation. But ultimately, we, we boil down as much to what everybody else has said that we don't understand either uh, how these Fabry Perot experiments are working. Uh, and I think that's all I have to say, Jorge. <laughs> all right, thank you, Joe. Uh, so uh, let me remind the audience that uh, we're not going to take oral questions. However, you can type your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom and it, Bob will, will take care of the most relevant ones. So let's begin with the questions. Uh, so in your experience as experimentalists or according to your perception as a theorist, what seems to be the criteria for reactions to be susceptible to cavity modification of kinetics? Are there clues towards understanding when will a reaction be accelerated or slowed down? And how do we bring together the absurd trends regarding bond selectivity and symmetry? Uh, Blake, you have some thoughts? <laughs> um, so why does it all work? Um, uh, and yeah, when? <laughs> and and when, when does it work? Um, well, frankly, I don't know. We can... I guess we can like collect what we see in the literature and, and come up with a couple of um, ideas. Uh, certainly bonds that are involved in the reaction might be uh, more susceptible to coupling, uh, coupling induced modification of reaction rates, although that's not necessarily the case. I think in the Abyssin science paper, they couple to modes that, that aren't directly um, involved in the reaction, although these normal modes are not entirely localized. And so um, maybe it, maybe any mode that one couples to could have some influence. Um, uh, why, why are there these resonant tuning effects? Uh, we don't know, but we know that there's a um, a dispersion, a shape in the dispersion curve. And so depending on where the cavity is tuned, you have a different distribution of polaritonic states. Um, uh, it, it appears that there is a much stronger impact on reactivity when K equals zero conditions are, are resonant with a particular mode. Um, <clears throat> Um, but, but, but frankly, I don't, I don't think I have a lot of insight. And why would a, why would a reaction speed up versus slow down? Um, I, I don't know. You could, you could um, qualitatively just say, make up arguments about, well, we are introducing decay channels. So if we decay out of a non-reactive um, configuration more readily, then maybe 
we can create reactive configurations more often and that might speed up reaction. And then of course, if you just decay out of a, a reactive transition st state or something like that, you could slow down a reaction. I know um, um, Howell has a, a pre or a, an archive manuscript that attempts to predict uh, conditions where you could get a uh, increase in rate or reaction rate using these loss arguments. Um, I guess I'll just leave it there. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Joe, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, well, I can, I can already respond to what Blake said. Blake makes it easy. So let me ask Blake one question then. <laughs> uh, is it obvious to you why in all the experiments, at least the ones that I know of, that the change in delta H and the change in delta S always goes in the same direction for the, for uh, the, act, for the activation? Uh, no, no, I don't know. Yeah, right. Uh, to me, it, does that, does, would that follow? Yeah. I, I don't, at least, at least that, that, those are all the experiments that I know. Maybe, maybe we begin by this, actually, if, Jorge, if I'm allowed to. I think there are, f how many papers, boy, now, now we're going to get a lot of people watching. How many papers are there that, you, that, that, that you're confident of uh, where they see cavity effects? How many, how, many, how many different molecules are you aware of? Okay. Uh, can I comment? Uh, oh, yeah, please. 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 You know, yeah. So uh, as far as no, like... Uh, pure molecule. One is that carbon silicon bond breaking process that uh, Thomas Eberson uh, group tried. And another one from a Japanese group, uh, Hakihido group, uh, they try to do these experiments in which uh, they call print cyclization. It's used like actually, it's a, it's a cyclization process with carbonyl. Uh, don't ask me the mechanism. Okay, so uh, th that's one. And the second one is this. And the third one that we tried, but that's through a different mechanism, cooperative effects. So uh, in the first case, uh, the mechanism is different. So see the, the whole difficulty, what we are also facing to understand. Now we have these three example in the hand and trying to make a general picture is quite hard at the end. And for, for any of these reactions is most likely uh, the carbon silicon bond breaking process. Of course, the carbon silicon, uh, there is a bond character of that around 860 bone numbers. You can see that is purely coming from carbon silicon, but you see that the, the science paper that Blake was uh, pointing, like there are also spectator bonds, uh, which basically also control the reaction mechanism. I mean, the, you, there is an action spectra, which is mentioned in the science paper that control, uh, you know, specifically if you target that band, this is goes similar like the work that there, are, there is another paper from George Pimental uh, in 1980s that they shows that you know some spectral band bonds can basically do this so that's uh, uh, quite amazing like you know how these are connected literally like you know they are basically involved they are called spectral bonds so one of them I, I remember correctly a middle group attached to the silicon we basically control it and then uh, this this aspect come to come into picture like if it, this is pure reactant coupling see you have to imagine that now when the reactant is coupled here the always the complication is the reactant is consumed during the process so during the consumption uh, of the reactant your coupling strengths also break up i mean it's, it goes away so we will not be able to experimentally figure out how this basically you know play a role but still there is this new path what we call free energy variation see if you say a catalysis or an uh, deacceleration we assume that the free energy i mean we can say that this way like catalysis has been defined by iupac by saying that free energy won't change but in all our cases free energy is just reshuffling one case go, uh, goes up and one case goes down i mean of course if you look into the the compartments of, of delta h and delta s i mean it also goes different in our case the cooperativity experiment what we see is that the free energy uh, drops by five kilojoule per mole uh, by 5k cal per mole, if I'm correct. And uh, the same thing, uh, uh, delta H as well as delta S both dropped, they went down. So delta is dropping, then we said that you create a more polar activated complex. That chemistry, you know, they use a perspective, say that if uh, if the bond stabilization happens for more polar activated complex, it stabilizes down. And, uh, but still beyond, uh, you know, we don't know how this really affecting the system. I mean, in that case, at least I can say that it's a charged species, but in the carbon silicon bond, it is actually uh, a pentavalent uh, bond, which is formed the fluorine attack and form a pentavalent bond. And uh, the paper claims at the end that it's becoming the entropy becoming slightly positive, which shows that this is uh, going through a dissociation mechanism instead of association. 
So, which is again a proposition. It's a chemist perspective. Okay. So, which still don't know mechanistically. It is not proved. So, uh, then this case, a uh, real uh, calculation has been required. I mean, at some point of view that people have to show that I think there are a couple of papers also very recently, but I am not sure about those aspects, but I'm, I'm still learning this. But as of now, I understood that each of these two, three molecule, which is short, basically shows different character in terms of uh, the free energy, if you, if you say. And uh, symmetry, I have no idea, but there are paper which, are, which is again from Thomas Abbasen group, but uh, that is also dif uh, a different cr criteria, like it's a complexation process. So which are, maybe I don't know whether it's related to what pure chemical reaction, what we are talking about here. This is my point of view as of now. It's right. Can I ask something related to this too? Do you know, do you know yeah. one question? Yeah. So you yeah. think that your your paper on this cooperative um, effect with the solvent the yes. effect is different than from the other works you think this is yes so uh, the cooperative experiments uh, literally we call solvolysis effect solvolysis effect is actually the solvent is playing a very crucial role solvent itself is involved in the reaction and it basically pull it so here we couple the solvent uh, so the coupling solvent uh, in in principle the vibrations are matching for that case exactly yeah. matching and once it exactly matches you're opening a channel for vibrational uh, energy transfer to the system that's what i assume that i just change the solvent ethyl acetate we used ethyl acetate uh, the carbonyl uh, you know what we did the carbonyl group which has exactly at 1570 uh, 1750 vo numbers which exactly matches the reactants uh, energy yeah. we just change the carbonyl c12 to c13 it moved by 30 vo numbers the reaction dropped by five to six times simply in outside the cavity so that's the reason we are so confident that by cavity coupling it's affected. So it's a equivalent to a solvolysis process. So it is not direct coupling. Okay, no, because from my point of view, yeah. I would think the effect is the same. Well, we don't know why, no, but I would think it's, the reason will be the same for the changes observed on this in this paper or in the others. Maybe I it would see. be nice in this in this work. Did you did you do the experiment without strong coupling to the solvent? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, can, they I, can, I can just share you some some. Well, maybe I'm going be... into too much detail. Don't worry. Uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please. If you if you want, I can just show you that that slide. What I was I'm sub uh, that basically justify what I am saying very quickly. I can share. Uh, no, no, no. I know what I know what you mean. I I've read uh, the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I so just meant that the, the, the point is that just uh, that vibration, which basically uh, directly overlapping straight away, we see the boosting. So when we move the cavity field slowly into that region, you see the boosting start and it pick up. It's also follow the line shape. That's much confident we are showing in that paper. So we are very clear. Then the moment you change C12 to C13, we see that everything drop i mean uh, i'm talking about like outside the system like in normally c12 we take a non-cavity condition the rate was something like you know 10 the moment you put uh, changed c12 uh, to c13 it dropped by roughly 10 become uh, four or five so that's uh, that's uh, fun here so just changing solvent it's not sol uh, solvent effect polarity effect uh, polarity effect is there along with you have this vibrational uh, what we call internal vibrational action to the solvent system basically trigger this thermal what do you call uh, thermal collision process in, in the system so these are coming under solvolysis i mean all general uh, you can call it a solvolysis process i mean this is maybe a chemist way of saying okay okay good yeah. thank you so it, the other panelists have another contribution that they want to make at this point. All right. Uh, oh, well, I mean, hey. yeah. uh, we have a question from the audience atten attendees. So it's a question to all the pan uh, exper experimentalists. So uh, the question is clearly the publication industry means that papers that show a if, uh, effect of strong coupling are more favored than those that report no effect. Are there no uh, results that are just didn't make it to publications or is this the, 
is it the case that almost everything tried worked? So this is a funny. This is a funny question. I, before I published my first paper in grad school, I did an experiment and it showed no effect. And I and I asked my professor in the group meeting, "Well, I finished it and we have all the data and it shows no effect. Is that publishable?" And the whole group laughed. Um, so uh, I I have only tried um, two chemistries. Uh, and they both seem to show an effect. Um, that's all I can comment about. Yeah, so, as yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, yeah. May I also comment like quickly because I know we are left and right trying different kind of named reactions, many reactions in the lab. This is I would say that is one of the limitations of 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 course this this is quite difficult because to find out a particular vibration and to exactly know that vibration involved in the reaction mechanism and also to know that it's going through the transition state that you're coupling it's quite hard literally if you look around the literature it's quite hard to find something which is basically useful so even the, what you'll do is you basically uh, fire, uh, search a library and try to do some some experiment which is somehow you can find out which are having very strong vibrations which are basically you can couple it at the end uh, you know you never know that uh, you know, you 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 can able to you. It's very difficult because literature is not there uh, already. You know that this vibration is right. You just uh, uh, that basically responsible. But those uh, things are uh, maybe if you think like uh, the one which are looking around small molecules. Like I think about like ethylene, acetylene, very very small molecule which cannot be used here. Because it's a uh, it's a different scenario, right? Because now you need to couple. You need to have enough coupling strength. If enough coupling strength is not there, you cannot be able to have uh, strong coupling conditions created. If strong coupling condition is not created, you cannot do anything like so. That's that's the issue. So all the molecule which is well studied, uh, available in the literature, including their energy surfaces and everything, is a small molecule. So quite hard to find systems exactly matching and define vibration which is responsible so that is the reason the limitation comes in so uh, okay then then you know let me ask you directly this uh, have there been systems where you have found a vibrational electron coupling by means of optical probing but where kinetic effects have not shown yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I was telling um, the first experiment we tried in Eberson group was a failure. Second experiment also we tried was a failure. We could not see anything literally in that system. Oh, I, I can tell you what a molecule. We tried actually a, 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 a cyclization of citronellol, a molecule which you can find in the market. You know, it's used for, for some perfume and other stuff. This convert into, uh, in citronellol is an aldehyde convert into alcohol through a one for addition. We were trying, it's a beautiful molecule. It's a liquid. We tried to couple because liquid has a very strong vibrational band. We tried to couple, but we could not see any effect actually at the end. Uh, then we tried a solid state reaction. So the, so, the solid state, you, you know, may be knowing this poly, uh, I forget, you know, it's available in Mer Merck is selling it actually as a coating for car and industry and so forth. This poly is, uh, it's called uh, uh, polyacene or some molecules like silicon nitrogen networks with a, with a long network, three dimensional network. So when you heat it, that all the nitrogen breaks up and nitrogen escape and form silicon dioxide. So you get actually silica. Uh, literally, you can coat, you know, on, on any surface, very, very small, small thickness. So it's a solid state reaction. You just need to slowly heat it. We try to do this experiment. Still, you know, the fundamental problem that you heat, then the elasticity is difficult. We cannot be able to figure out exactly uh, what is happening in that experiment. Then, actually, my colleague Anoop came with this concept. Okay, this molecule is is well studied in organic chemistry, which is one of the best molecule, and it's almost 100% yield. In a day, that people won't even think about uh, this experiment because you know it's it's uniquely used uh, as one of the protection and deprotection strategy in organic synthesis. That molecule is the silicon carbon. That worked very well, and it is working beautifully as well. Like we try left and right different concentration, all the kinetic uh, kinetic effects and everything, thermodynamic kind of effects. Everything worked very well, and it's feasible. So I am saying the point here is that it's not. Uh, Actually, also the one point that came to my mind that we were in our mind, we were thinking that this reaction accelerate because we see bond softening, the idea of Bell laboratory case, or even the Pimandel work, you say that you can speed up the reaction. On the other hand, we see slowing down there. So we were still confused at the time. Okay, this is how it went through. 
and um, uh, still yeah now we have few more few more this uh, this ester hydrolysis experiment few of them are working very nicely in our lab at least so but still it has to be explored and people in the field has to come up and then maybe have to do it um, i have i have two quick comments uh hoel beat me to one of them uh it, it would probably be very useful to include reactions that don't work in a publication, either in the SI or in the discussion, just so that the record is out there. Um, yeah. uh, and then of course that might help us understand, you know, what classes of reactions are susceptible and what aren't. Um, and, and just to share my approach, uh, since I'm not a very sophisticated chemist at all, I surveyed um, undergrad chemistry labs and I looked at what chemical reactions they do to teach teenagers how chemistry works. And then I tried to select molecules that were small and simple and that had strong absorptive features, um, uh, azide or uh, carbonyls or some other you know, features that I thought would be strong absorbers. And then from those kind of down selected a few, chatted with some colleagues. And that's, that's how I you know, settled on choosing the couple of reactions I've looked at um, and like I said before, they both work. So I haven't run across any that haven't yet. And of course, if you look in the literature, the array of reaction types that seem to work is pretty broad. Yeah, so we think about it. One question, can it be that the only reaction that is um, catalyzed is the one from the cooperative solvent? It's just to... Uh, Yes, actually, that's the one which is now uh, available in literature. Also, also the work from Hura, which is basically still in Kama ah. case. So he retired oh, and he's not case. in the field now. So uh, this is another 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 work he tried hydrolysis experiment. So which shows the very high values of 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 of, of reaction rate, uh, which he died, uh, which he tried when he was in NEC National Electronic Corporation that uh, department. Now I don't think he's there. He retired now, and then so nobody is taking up that afterwards. So. That's the I, one I know that other than this. Yeah. I thought okay. there was the, the charge transfer reaction. Yes, um, yes. There's an iodine containing compound. And I think that I one was able to show slowing down and speeding up depending on the but, mode. That uh, no, called. that is actually the uh, symmetry. Uh, the symmetry small, uh, one is more stable than the other. You change the, the equilibrium to one exactly. side or the other, depending on the symmetry of the, of the okay. mode. Yes. The free energy calculation from from uh, looking into to, to to coupling the two modes E and A modes they call degenerate and uh, uh, non-degenerate modes of mesetylene system coupled. So uh, that's also very interesting. Like I mean, that's where I mean symmetry rules uh, or ideas comes in. Like uh, whether it can like you take mesetylene like the three methyl group on the benzene ring and connect to the iodine, it forms a complex. Then this complex will have a symmetry. Then uh, then you look into the the particular what you call uh, the degenerate and non-degenerate modes of this particular benzene ring, and then you can see that one of them, if you couple the, uh, the 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 free energy jumps up, and the other case it's slow down, it goes down. So that, that, that's a paper of a person group basically showing this. Yeah. So that's not yeah, a reaction. The, the complexation, but, yeah. Of course, you can call it as a reaction. At the end. But most reactions, no, there's no symmetry. I mean, there are not many systems, no, yeah. that preserve symmetry all the time. So probably that is not that general. I mean, Yes. So, you know, I, I have also a question to, to, to theorize. I mean, this, this is way like, I was thinking about a reaction, a simple reaction, if you think about, like, even if it goes through a transition state, it has to attain a particular particular geometry in which the reaction has to come up and form a, like, a particular configuration. Then only it will basically uh, enter into that energy and then break. Like, you know, you pick up and go, go down. So when you couple, uh, when you do strong coupling, the problem is that you're coupling the reactant ground state straight away. So this is always triggering issues, whether you're coupling the reactant state, ground state, or we are at the way that you're entering into the transition state is also coupled to the field, we have no idea. 
So this is always a, as a nightmare, even if you do thermodynamics of the system, thermodynamics only stay, talk about like what happened between the initial state and the final state. You cannot talk about anything, anything in between. So kinetic will basically figure out at least the reaction goes in the time scale. But here, initial state and final state, you just predict what is happening. That's what we does actually in, in our equation or all of these cases. But may not be true, like, you know, real active activation barrier is something else, which is, which is uh, you know, quite difficult to understand uh, as of now, unless otherwise the most theoretical intervention is required in this case, uh, in which the field is involved, how does it do? I guess so, the, 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 the problem with what, with, that, with what you're saying here is that uh, for a chemical reaction, the initial and the final stages are very well defined. Is there a bond or is there not a bond, right? Uh, for a given molecule. And the ground state couples collectively to the photon mode. So it's not, so I believe that we understand what the initial and the final stages have to be, unless you start thinking to yourself that there's, you know, a motion of some enormous number of molecules altogether or some weird new ground state. Uh, that seems very unlikely. So that's why everybody is so uh, ner nervous about uh, these experiments and we always understand them. I want to say, uh, Jorge, that I, I don't know, we're sort of not going off topic, but you asked us what our, what our wish list was. And one of your, one of the Q and A people here has just asked one of my wish list problems. I want to ask Blake and, and Gino, if, if I may, uh, two, two wish list questions. So one of them, Igor has basically asked effectively, uh, can you imagine doing the experiment uh, where you actually look at how rates are modified as a function of Q for a cavity? Right, I would love to do this. This would be like, talk, talk about, okay, that, that's the first question. And the second question is, are you aware of an experiment? I'm not aware of one, but are you aware of an experiment where someone has taken a, um, an integer or a, 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 a whatever, if, where, where I have a cavity and I make it double or make it twice its size. In this sense, if I do it the right way, I should be able, the coupling will be different, but I should be able to make sure that all the, or for the most part, all of the vibrations that I have will line up in the same way, as long as I take a simple multiple of what I started with. Do I still see the same effects as far as cavity or, 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 or similar, not, not at the same, but similar effects? These are the two questions that I, I would love to understand. So yes, thank you, Igor. He works with me at the Naval Research Lab. Uh, that would be excellent to do. Um, I think we should also compare um, dielectric versus metallic mirrors um, since they generate a different field profile and metal has the um, uh, capability of screening charge in a different way. Um, uh, so yeah, I, it would be interesting to see. And I, I guess as the Q goes down, the uh, cavity loss would hasten. And if cavity loss is the mechanism by which you're modifying chemistry, I guess we'll see it I guess you would see more modification when the cavity is lost here, I guess, but then you're able to exchange energy with the molecule less effectively. So I don't know how that all washes out. And I haven't looked at higher order cavity. I mean, I, I've looked a bit at higher order cavities, which is what you're talking about, but uh, the, it, can get, it gets really messy very quickly because there are so many fringes and you want to have them not uh, interacting with every every yeah. mode available, so that gets yeah. tough. But but Gino, maybe you've looked at some higher order cavities. Yeah, it's the same problem here as well. Like if you want to use higher order cavity, then the Q will be better, especially with the system of fabric per configuration. But the issue is that more than one mode will couple, then you'll have issues in figuring out what is exactly going on in the system. So initially we try doing so because we have limitations. So we, we tried, we, we, we can start with four micron. That's a minimum literally experiments can go down because of many other, because of surface roughness and other issues with the fabric or configuration. So maybe it would be possible to go down still, but as of now we can only go up to four micron. Going down will be quite hard. Then you get actually uh, first mode uh, quite closer Then they have a very low Q, then you can couple second and third and fourth, et cetera. Uh, but uh, such an experiment has not been tried so far. Yeah, uh, I mean, at least on, 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 on such a scale. Yeah. When we talk about the interpretation, the interpretation of these experiments, as far as I can tell already, is messy enough. I would just like to know if there's an effect period. Yeah. Right. I mean, bottom line, the Ebbison mm -hmm. group was able to, you know, take a mass spec at the end, 
or I think it's a mass spec, right? And actually, you know, yes, yes. In, in yeah. the end, flush out and see was the did the rate go up or down? I'm just curious. Ex even if even if I can't interpret it, what what we find? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So actually, I, so far, no experiment in this direction. I mean, as far as you know, for pure reaction, chemical reaction. But I remember uh, Professor Carl Bogerson was presenting this in one of the conference, one of the previous sections in which he tried to look into the rate of triplet. Uh, you know, there is a, the experiment in which he tried uh, the inversion of uh, triplet to singlet uh, process. I forget the mo molecules and so forth. He was trying uh, somewhere, some control experiments. He say that if you go to high Q, which I'm not sure, but maybe he can clarify it later, uh, that you say that the, the, the lowest Q in which, I mean, in my opinion also, like the Q in which you say that this basically match exactly with the line shape of the molecule is the best case to couple. I mean, to see the best effect here. That's what my perspective in this direction then going to high Q, like you, want, you don't want to have a DBR equivalent, then what happened is the DBR is having a very sharp uh, vibration or uh, line shape, which basically pass through the whole ensemble of the molecule don't do anything else. I mean, the splitting energy itself will be very, very small for the system. So if the, if the full width of the, of the cavity mode is equivalent to the full width of the molecule, that's the best situation uh, for us to get the best coupling as well as the effects. I mean, this is maybe, you know, this is my perspective view. I, it's not done experimentally. Yeah. Oh, hey, uh, if, yeah, if I may interrupt. So there's uh, probably too many questions to address. So I'll just uh, select some of them. So there's a specific question to Claudia from Bill Burns. So the question is, could you summarize the fascinating question you mentioned and uh, what you refer to as the resonance question and what's the problem and why is it difficult to solve? Is that so clear? What I, what I, yeah, what I meant is that um, like, the so the theoret the different theoretical papers that try to understand these experiments, which are by Joel's group, uh, Subodnik and Nilsen and Tauli and us and someone else, I think. Well, none of this uh, can show. So none can show that um, there are changes when their polarizations are formed. So there, no one uh, has been able to understand this. So there's a paper by Joel uh, Group, no, on electron transfer reactions. Yes. And there, it's non-adiabatic reactions, so it's different. But for adiabatic reactions, normal reactions, uh, thinking about the potential energy surface and how this can be modified under strong coupling, and then if uh, you need uh, polaritons or not, we don't. There's no work showing that um, energy barriers are changed when when strong coupling is there. So. We don't understand this, right, from a theoretical point of view. Uh, so I, I would like to point to point out that uh, there is this work by by uh, Frank Wu, where he does see uh, changes uh, depending on frequency, but in the collective regime it doesn't work. Okay. No. I, I also, that paper. So it's an interesting idea. The thing is that um, yeah, I was checking this paper a lot because uh, they do the same kind of approach we do with the same model. And the, we don't, so we, we did rate calculations uh, with uh, the Hamiltonian, so with considering quantum nuclei and a quantum photonic mode, and we don't see any resonance effects. So when you detune the frequency from the model, let's say, and from the cavity, we don't see any resonance, and they get it, but they, they have really large Rabi splitting. So I think that's why we get different results because they have like 800 to the 100 centimeters to the minus one Rabi splitting there. And also the resonance effect goes from like zero to one EV. No, in the experiment, it's um, it's just along the, the, no, the, the vibration. So 20, 30 centimeters to the minus one. So I don't think that, so it's a nice idea, but I don't think that's the, the core no, of, of this experiment. I, I, I don't know a, if I answered Bill, but I, I had a thought just this morning and maybe someone can like correct me if, if this is complete nonsense, but when thinking about the resonant effect, so the um, cav uh, reaction is only modified when the cavity is tuned at K equals zero to the mode of interest. Okay. 
Um, even though this whole span, this whole family of polaritons is still available to all the molecules and they don't know what angle they're sitting at, right? Um, it, is it relevant that um, when you are tuned to a given mode at k equals zero, the two polaritons that you create that um, a, apparently are involved in the reaction kinetics, those two, those polaritons are exactly half molecule and half photon. So the, the, the amount of time the excitation spends in each is equal. They're able to exchange uh, energy or, or be coherent with each other um, on an equal basis. Maybe that maximizes the effect that this optical mode can have on the molecule. Um, if they're detuned from one another um, and this polariton is mostly optical cavity, let's say, um, I don't know, maybe the effect should be stronger or maybe it's not able to kind of pass energy back and forth to the molecules many times or something like that. Does that make any sense to um, theorists or other experimentalists or anybody? You know, the words are nice. It's just, <laughs> it's, it, it's hard to, uh, to put that into a mathematical flavor. That's, that's always what seems to, but anyway, Claudia, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, what I want, yeah, what I wanted to say is that, um, uh, yeah, it's 50%, right? You have one molecule, everything is very symmetrical, you have 50%, but once you have a little bit of disorder, you have many dark states with a little cavity component. So I don't think uh, it's then, but then of course you, when, when you do the spectrum, you see the lower upper branch, but that's many distributed over many different dark states which are not that dark in reality because there's disorder and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all the molecules are not the same and so in that sense i don't i don't see it. maybe joe what do you think <laughs> no if we saw i mean if, if we understood how to go from polar you know we always considered the k equals zero case first and so if we understood why it was that equal numbers get, you know uh, and these collective excitations that gave you the absorption as they translated into reactions for individual molecules, we would publish it in science. No, we don't, I don't, I, <laughs> I, we can argue that K equals zero somehow makes the most sense, but yet that doesn't, that, you know, that doesn't get me very far, yeah. unfortunately. Well, I, I was reminded of it because of Gino's comment about matching the line widths. You know, generally we try to match the cavity and molecular line widths and, and, uh, coupling can be strongest in that case, or at least you don't want them to be too dissimilar. But if you imagine, and there was some talk about uh, changing cavity Q earlier, if you imagine that the cavity Q is changing, and let's say the cavity is much lossier than the molecule, then you know you kind of have like a one-way valve one way. But if you're in the other condition, you maybe you have a one-way valve the other way. Yeah, boy, I, I always imagined, I, I think you and I spoke about this once before, Blake, I always imagined that there'd be a peak, right? That there'd be a certain Q value that if it was too high or too low, the effect would have to go away. Uh, and maybe we're in the same agreement then there. Right, and maybe that's matching, yeah, matching the uh, molecular dephasing or something. Something like that, yeah. Um, yeah, I wish I could tell you more. I, I, So uh, we have uh, other, another relevant uh, questions from, uh, from, from state. Uh, it's kind of related to your last question from Bill. So what chemical reaction to choose for such a smoking gun experiment as supposed by, uh, by Philip? And he, uh, yeah, the attendee also has a, related question for Gino, um, who, uh, and Gino mentioned that some molecules failed and others did not. So what was fundamentally different in the cases where they absorbed the effect from the cases they don't, they didn't? Yeah. 
is that clear or yeah yeah so for 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 first question like you say he asked that which one will be the 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 best molecule to try in this case i will say the small molecule we have to choose a small molecule which can be done and uh, we know that the vibration is responsible for that that's our main problem for us i mean the experiment which is failed in our case is that we don't know which vibration is involved in it and there are like you know you just take a large molecule it has 3 and minus 6 degrees of freedom you basically have all the vibrational states available you try to couple you cannot do that manually like you know each of them and also experimentally hard to get them so what we target is like for example the failed case one case is citronellol citronellol case is carbonyl group we try to couple carbonyl group actually uh, most likely not involved in the re rate determining reaction mechanism that may be the reason we will not able to figure out that that case is failed and that case is failed because it's not but, involved in the rate determining step but, but that's for the reason we science, concluded in the science paper you coupled to methyl so and methyl is not methyl ah, yeah. bending mode that case actually that that's why he specifically mentioned it's a spectator bond which is connected to the carbon silicon and he controlled the process partly that's why i mean that's the reason i can I mean, the same thing i i what the thing i pull out from the job primordial work that you have a spectral bond you can also control you nearby you control the process but if something like a carbonyl group you say i target carbonyl functional group transformation carbonyl to something else carbonyl to oh i want to see that then i think about carbonyl i couple the carbonyl but may not be the carbonyl is involved in the rate determining process so then we will not able to see pull out the rate equation out of it the rate expression out of it. they don't show any any change that's what we are facing now so uh, so the transition state is something else or maybe it goes through another step in which the reaction is involved that that will be the rate of the step then coupling carbonyl won't make any sense it won't make any difference so that's the issue that's a uh, that's bottleneck i mean i don't know how to 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 deal with that so that's the reason we have to take a small molecule well studied and and try it so which is i mean uh, people are looking around left and right to figure out such molecule to try i don't know like we were trying almost 3 years now we didn't get anything very good in in that way to show that it's really happening and this is it so so can can, can i can i ask you Blake something and then i think i think i i, I can see in the chat next door that's going people are going wild let me just ask you one one thing before i forget here i, I you got about the, the the experiments that are reported 2016 to 2020. They they talk about rates uh, rate differences between five and or five to ten basically. I think ten's about the max. Um, at the public of the published papers, you got about a thirty percent effect, right? Which is which is much smaller. Is your feeling yeah. is your feel and 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 I don't know how many molecules you've been working with, but it seems like it's a hard experiment. It's probably one, is my guess. <laughs> um, is is if, if, is your feeling? Do you have any feeling as to why what's different about what you, but your, about the? It was your cell, right? No, it wasn't your cell. Uh, was, um... Yeah, I mean, no, I I don't know exactly why. I mean, it could be a different molecular. It could be a different system. Um, it could be the fact that um, maybe I don't have a cavity that's tuned. You know, of, of the data points I have, maybe I don't have a cavity that's tuned perfectly to the resonance to maximize the effect. But, but uh, you, you did tune the cavity, I thought, right? Well, I did tune the cavity, but I have a finite number of points, you know, a finite oh, number I see. of points I, I examined. Um, Otherwise, is the cavity the same as theirs? I mean, I don't know, experimentally, just, I'm try, just trying to understand. Uh, qualitatively, it's about the same. It's uh, metal coated mirrors. There's a dielectric layer on the surface uh, to protect it or passivate it. Um, same, same type of cell. Um, we do measure the reaction rates over a much longer time period because we have a pretty slow reaction, but but I I think qualitatively it's it's similar, yeah, yeah, and and uh, cavity order is about the same, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean it's a different it's a different chemistry though, you know. Yeah, you just wonder. Um... Right. I mean, it, it, the laws of statistics, I know people are saying in the chat room that we have enough data here. Why don't the theorists have explanations? And yet uh, I think to myself, there's so little data here. I'd like to understand more. Is it, do, if I would make a distribution of, you know, of, of even of all SN2 reactions, if I were to think about trying to couple them here, are we talking about a 5% change, a 0% change in general, and once in a while an outlier? I, I'm very, I'm very, I, I, without statistics, it's even just hard to Right. Well, if you're thinking about how much data do you need to, you know, build and define an entirely new mechanism, 
that's probably different for all the different classes of yeah. chemistries. Yeah, we don't have nearly enough data for that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we're already past the hour, and I guess it's okay if we keep going for uh, ten minutes or so. Uh, I mean, this this conversation is is indeed fascinating, and uh, of course there are a lot of uh, questions who have not been answered. Fortunately, most most of the questions that I have prepared have been addressed to some extent in this in this discussion. They they have developed organically. Uh, but just to wrap up, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, so, so what's next? What do you think are the most pressing questions that need to be addressed? And in your perspective, what are the foreseeable applications of, of these kind of effects? And which ones do you think are limited by a lack of a theoretical framework? Uh, Claudia? Oh, okay. Uh, so, well, I think the applications. I mean, if the this this the experiment show. I mean, show there are changes, right? So, this this has a lot of potential. And for instance, there's this last paper, now by the group in Japan. I think uh, that they show that with vicious stress coupling, they change the um, how MOVs uh, crystallize in different phases. So. I mean, that seems really powerful no? for material scientists, uh, scientists and so on. But I guess that until we don't understand how all this works, we won't be able to really exploit it. And what was the first question? I don't remember, sorry. What, what do you think are the more pressing questions that need to be addressed? Uh, yeah, like understand, I mean, understand what's going on. Uh, from theoretical point of view, it doesn't seem like the potential energy surface, which is what one thinks of when thinking about chemical reaction, are changing. Um, why some bonds yes and some no? Or for instance, in in this uh, work I showed in the in a webinar here, many vibrations in these molecules are really coupled. So it's not that I'm coupling to pure silicon carbon or whatever. So why some yes and some not? So other kinds of uh, reactions, no? Maybe it could be explored because most that are reported are SN2 types. So the Prince I uh, uh, the um, I think the one in the print cyclation, there's some attack also. Well, they are similar. Maybe some organic reaction kind of deals other, something different would be interesting. Maybe someone tried and didn't work. I don't know. But I think, yeah, understand if it's some non equilibrium effect, no, as these uh, papers are now discussing, or it's the potential energy surface, which doesn't seem so. What's going on? Thank you. Uh, Blake, do you have thoughts on this question? Um, well, I, I would say congratulations to the all the attendees, because I think you've probably defined uh, most of the questions that we should try to answer. Um, I think hand in hand are what systems do and don't work. And that probably helps identify the mechanism. Um, and then, and then I, I, I think even with a vague definition of a mechanism or, or classes that work or don't work, the theorists, I think, would um, probably have a, a easier time um, kind of sinking their teeth into a problem that's already a little bit more constrained. Um, and, and I think Gino was right on the money. The, the simpler molecule, uh, the better, um, probably simple unimolecular reactions that are well understood in low order cavities. And um, so I think, I mean, this is, this is a, a, low, a low tech problem, but I think redesign of the cells that we use every day is required because um, they don't afford a lot of controllability um, or reaching these very, uh, these lower order cavity modes. And that would simplify a lot of things. Um, you'd also be able to look at mode order effects without completely congesting the entire spectrum. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess that's what what I would say. Um, I, I yeah. So 
So I'll stay there. I think all the things we brought up now are probably the things we need to get to work on. I'm hoping that, and, and I think this is the case in the next year or two or three or more, um, the number of experimentalists working on this are growing. You know, the, the progeny of the Ebison group are kind of spreading around the globe and setting up their own groups and, and, and getting results and whatnot. And so that should start to fill in the picture of, um, of what works and what doesn't. And that, sh that should be a kind of a big boost for, for theorists. Yeah. Uh, Joe, thoughts on this question? I mean, I, I, I don't know if the community does. I know that I certainly am not convinced yet that I even have the right Hamiltonian, to be honest, to explain some of these effects. Um, in our group, we're constantly wondering, can we get away with only having one cavity mode? How many do we need? Can we, do we, do we need, do we need, uh, is minimal coupling the right way of looking at it for the Hamiltonian? I mean, we have, we have so many questions. I think what, I, I hate to say it, but on some level we'll have to, I, I hate to think it's true, but it's very possible that, you know, uh, we'll have to do some very, very complicated, uh, uh, really almost exact quantum dynamical benchmarks and on big systems, let them run for months to sort of convince ourselves, even for small Hamiltonians, are there effects that we're not seeing because we're, there's some sort of, there's sort of obscure quantum mechanical things that, we, that they don't pop up? Or is it at bottom that uh, we have the wrong Hamiltonian? And that seems possible to me. I, I can't explain it in most ways. Most of the times that we try to come to terms with this, um, we end up convincing ourselves that uh, except for a few, you know, except for a few things we haven't tried yet. Uh, most of the time we end up convincing ourselves that like, I guess your, your colleague Igor, Blake has said that these <laughs> things are just hard to understand where they come from. All right. Um, and Gino. All right. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the main thing, I mean, I'd say the dream experiment that I want to do is saying this is the same thing, but I was telling him before as well, like you have to try a small molecule and we have to go back to this old model. Like somebody tried, like I still go back to the experimental experiments or the experiments in which you can do some uh, velocity mapping or some very simple physical chemistry experiment that people tried before exactly calculate what is happening to like you take about like a simple case hydrogen chloride bone breaking or something in gas phase or similar system somebody can come up with these arguments or such kind of experiment that will be a dream experiment in which you can prove it specifically like this is what's happening here and then you know these are the velocity pi mapped out of this reaction which is coupled and not coupled and you can compare it and see that i can look into branching many 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 issues settled points will be solved if you can try to figure out some some experimental techniques other than this it's come up like which basically implement you know that there are many other experiments like people use one thing is velocity mapping that come into my mind that straight away people use if calculation of a chemical reaction Okay, in which how the kinetic energy and potential energy changes within the system. Uh, so it's one of the things is quite amazing, but I don't know how to do deal with this kind of a pre-configuration. You have to think about an open configuration there, most likely an open structure. So this is uh, the dream experiment that I have in, I mean, see somebody else do you know, in this particular case. So uh, maybe it will shine some light into this specifically from experimental perspective. So, or maybe like you have to go back to the 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 the, the matrix methods that Pimental used. Maybe somebody have to think about this, like you know, then figure out what is happening. But still, in a matrix method, is itself is complicated because it's a cold finger. You have to key, you have to deposit gases and do this experiment. It's quite hard, literally, in such a configuration that we are still using so primitive. Uh, you know what? What fun is here is we are still doing static uh, kinetic measurements. It's been almost four years, so I'm trying to put, put a flow control on it. It's quite hard uh, to do because uh, the dynamic is happening really, like where I know numbers are so small here in these small micrometer cavities. So you can even, out, even, even pull out water to the system. Uh, it's quite hard uh, due to the viscosity effects if you go really down. So that's why flow controls this and flow. I mean, somebody have this idea, maybe it'll come out. It'll be so nice that the community can basically understand and these subtle points will be solved at some point uh, by doing very, very small molecules like that, like a unimolecular reaction that's like Blake's explained before. 
So that should be the point towards the experimental direction. So I would say the perspective towards experiment. Yeah. All right. Well, so it's a well over seventy-five minutes. So I think it's a it's a good place to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would like to thank uh, our panelists and all the attendees. Uh, this this conversation was really engaging. Was fascinating. Uh, there were many things happening in the chat and the Q and A. So that's that's just a testament of how interesting this topic is and and how uh, the scientific community should uh, you know work on it and, and, and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, I think that what we're going to do is we're going to document all these conversations going on and in the YouTube video we are going to share links to to PDFs uh, with everything in the chat and the and the Q and A. Um, By the way, uh, uh, yes. some of the panelists, I guess the chat, can we keep the chat? I want to, I want to write to some of the panelists here who wrote things on. I have some things I want to say in particular, one of the, can we, can we, can, is this going to die when, when, when this turns off? Jorge, can I, can I look at the people who are writing different things or will this all? Uh, so so that, that's basically what I was saying. I'm going uh, okay. to collect all the chat and, uh -huh. and write a document. So the, uh, oh, okay, okay. once I we see. upload the right. YouTube video, you can have access. To It'll that. both be there. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, so yeah, well, uh, so this was the, the last webinar of the year. Uh, we, we want to thank you, all of you for, for your continued support. Uh, well, the, the, the year is over, uh, but we will continue with this effort for the upcoming year. We hope to, to keep you engaged, to keep you participating and uh, well, Happy holidays. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. See you next year. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.